Hello. So today's class will discuss science, disability rights, and activism. And I'll make reference to the reading for this week. And I'll also make reference to other writings um, by critical disability scholars. And I'll finally finish by discussing an artist, Kusama, uh, whose work has been written about by feminist scholars uh, in relation to art. and uh, ideas of, I guess, mental health, but also um, the ways that the mind is kind of understood um, by those who write about Kusama and other artists uh, is often um, not from the framework of someone who thinks that we are all rational, beings all the time or should be and uh, it's interesting to just think about what the creative mind um, means or looks like uh, from different theoretical and political and philosophical perspectives. So the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is part of the Canadian Constitution. Section 15 of the Charter makes it clear that every individual in Canada, regardless of race, religion, national or ethnic origin, color, sex, age, or physical or mental disability is to be considered equal. So the Charter um, is often thought to be Canada's most um, lasting and uh, unshakable set of legal rights. And it is upheld uh, at the level of the national or federal law, federal government of Canada. So it isn't enough to just have these rights though. One has to feel entitled to have rights. Um, and, but, many feminist scholars have discussed is one's entitlement to enact their rights. So it's one thing to have legal rights, but who feels as though they have the right to take legal action or to have their rights upheld by others and to advocate for themselves. Um, and people, people with disabilities have increasingly become vocal as a political group and as a group of people who have legal rights that must be upheld. So critical disability studies is an emergent field of academic research, teaching, theory building, public scholarship, and something I'll call educational advocacy. And this is from your reading this week. So critical disability studies um, is a contemporary field of study uh, that often approaches social problems from the perspective and political problems and economic issues from the perspective of people with disabilities. Um, it also really focuses on looking at ableism and its obstacles through the lens of intersectionality. So critical disability theory often looks at oppressive forces like systemic racism, homophobia, and ableism, and looks at how these ways of understanding life and who has the right to a good quality of life are intertwined. So the critical part of 
critical disability studies suggests its alignment with areas of intellectual inquiry, sometimes awkwardly called identity studies, rooted in the political and social transformations of the mid 20th century brought forward by the broad civil and human rights movement. These movements pressed both law and the social order toward an expansion of rights for people previously marginalized or excluded from full participation in exercising the obligations and benefits of equal citizenship. The ideas of equality and equal access for all that propelled the broad US civil rights movement led to the legal desegregation of schools in the mid 20th century and changed the composition of the learning environment. With that came changes in what counted as knowledge in educational settings. In other words, when people excluded from the educational environment were included, knowledge about who we are as a community expanded along with that. So there is a trajectory then from uh, the formation or from the, uh, I guess, public uh, articulation of the U.S. civil rights movement as a really prominent political movement in the U.S., the desegregation of schools and the mobilization of other excluded people, like people with disabilities who... Uh, advocate for rights in public institutions that are often made only with one group of very privileged people in mind. So the actual construction of the university um, and the ways that washrooms are constructed, ramps, access to the actual space of the university has obviously been designed with one group of people in mind or with able-bodied people, but previous to this, this was also true that the school was often a place where only white people and middle-class white people went and only men. So this obviously changed because of the civil rights movement and the feminist movement and queer movement and people with disabilities um, are also those who have legal access to public institutions. So beginning then in the US in the early 1970s, new knowledge perspectives and bodies of knowledge began to emerge. First, perhaps as women's studies, African-American studies, then as critical race theory, feminist theory, queer theory, and most recently, critical disability studies. So while critical disability studies is a sister to women's and gender studies or critical race studies, it is distinctive in several ways. First, it grew out of a civil rights movement in the United States that was stealth in comparison to the women's movement or the black civil rights movement. The social justice that the disability rights movement achieved moved forward largely through desegregation laws and policies carried out through changes in the built environment. For people with disabilities to be integrated into the educational system required not just opening previously closed doors, but retrofitting schools with technologies that people with disabilities needed to be present and to learn. So we've talked about eugenics and Nazism throughout the class. And I guess if you were to think about the impetus behind groups of people who don't want to share space with others, who don't want to meet others, who don't want to be friends with others, uh, who don't want to have any relationships with others, then I do think uh, it could be possible that these people who are so exclusionary are fascists. Um, the language of Nazism or the term fascism or Nazism often seems extreme, but 
If you were to think about it in relation to previous classes we've had where we've discussed eugenics and the sterilization, the forced sterilization of indigenous women and the history of eugenics, which prevented certain women from having children um, and the alignment of supposed quote unquote health um, with class and racial purity, then I don't think that Nazism or fascism is really rare. Canada's history of nation building has often involved genocidal ideas of who can stay alive and who can be a Canadian and who can have Canadian children. And this is evinced in the history of forced schooling of indigenous children who were subject to extreme forms of abuse and torture, including sexual abuse. Um, the sterilization of indigenous women still continues in Canada and there are ongoing class action lawsuits throughout Canada. Um, there was a Chinese head tax placed on Chinese immigrants. The Komagatu the Koma Maru was a, was a ship uh, of Indian immigrants who wanted to immigrate to Canada and they were turned back. Um, Anti-Black racism in Canada originates in slavery, which began, I think, in the 13th century, a long, long time ago in New... And there's have been long histories of slavery, particularly in New France, which is Quebec now, and in Africville, in Nova Scotia. Um, and... I think we've discussed Sadia Hartman's work about slavery and the ways that Black women were prevented from having children or the reproduction of Black women was obviously controlled uh, in order for people to have more and more slaves. And so the children that someone had who was a slave would also be slaves. So there was obviously a eugenic policy to control how many children slaves had and who they had children with. Um, so it isn't really strange to me to think about people being fascists or having these kind of Nazi-like desires or a racially or ethnically pure population to control the economy. The treatment of people with disabilities during the Holocaust uh, involved actively killing those who had disabilities and also diagnosing people with certain disabilities, which then made them supposedly unfit workers uh, and then allowed for the internment of people with disabilities or people who are called people with disabilities in hospitals and camps. And uh, we talked about Nazi medicine last week. And so constructing someone as being unhealthy or unfit uh, is inextricable from the history of Nazism and systemic racism and colonialism. Um, and also pathologizing those who have disabilities uh, was also central to uh, policies or programs carried out by the Third Reich. So I think what often happens after the passage of laws against Nazism and fascism is we move and the abolition of slavery and the end of colonialism is that we move from uh, an ideology in which certain people do not even have the right to life to uh, capitalism where people are constantly told they don't have the right to a good quality of life because they aren't smart enough or they aren't good enough to have a good job or to live in a certain neighborhood. So it is still this idea though, uh, underlying it, that 
if it was not for the law, people would not have the right to be alive at all. But because of the law, we can all sell our labor. However, certain people still will never have a good job because they're not smart enough. And they're not um, attractive enough or they can't be friends who network with people or live in certain neighborhoods. So I still think that a lot of people are fascists. And that's my personal belief. So severely mentally and physically disabled people, as well as those perceived to have disabilities, were targeted because of Nazi beliefs that disabled people were a burden both to society and to the state. From 1939 to 1941, the Nazis carried out a program of euthanasia known as the T4 program. The name T4 is an abbreviation of Tiergartenstrasse 4, the address from which the program was coordinated. In 1933, the law for the prevention of hereditary disease offspring was passed, allowing for the forced sterilization of those regarded as unfit. This included people with conditions such as epilepsy, schizophrenia, and alcoholism. I'm really skeptical about the language of mental health and the constant use of this language of mental health to try to, to diagnose people uh, as having quote unquote mental health issues. Or, I mean, it's often used in this way that's kind of not at all nice and sometimes even involves some form of defaming people so people are told they should go to therapy or they have mental health issues. And it's sometimes done with this kind of language of, I think, um, pastoral care. Like if a woman is, I guess, angry, she should go to therapy. And I think it's actually uh, really condescending and rude. And I also think it's something that happens when people are threatened of others, that the language of kind of therapy or mental health is actually used to uh, to pacify political critique. So prisons, nursing homes, asylums, care homes for the elderly, and special schools were targeted to select people for sterilization. It has been estimated that between 1933 and 1939, 360,000 individuals were subject to forced sterilization. The point is with like mental health issues, firstly, it's not against the law to have epilepsy or schizophrenia or alcoholism. It's not against the law to have mental health issues, but one could also ask why certain people uh, are kind of treated so badly that they might have psychological trauma. And is there no legal redress or political accountable, accountability or economic justice to say, I don't know, cisgender, heterosexual, white middle-class people who are sometimes very, very mean to others. And this meanness, I think, can veer towards uh, illegal behavior and a violation of the Charter and Rights and Freedoms. And then we get to the question of legal accountability and financial compensation. In 1939, the killing of disabled children and adults began. All children under the age of three who had illnesses or a disability, such as down syndrome, sorry, I stuttered, I, I hope it's okay with you, such as such as Down syndrome or cerebral palsy were targeted under the T4 program. A panel of medical experts were required to give their approval for the euthanasia or supposed mercy killing of each child. So the panel of experts and the use of medical doctors to kill people with people with disabilities was central to Nazism and the Holocaust. What was also true is that many Nazis lied and said that Jewish people and specifically Jewish women and girls had a disability to justify the use of medical uh, 
Nazism, medical fascism, to kill Jewish people uh, or to, to fire Jewish people and then steal all their money and property. So many parents of people with disabilities were unaware of the fate of their children, instead of being told that they were being sent for improved care. After a period of time, parents were told their children had died of pneumonia. Then their bodies were cremated to stop the spread of disease. Following the outbreak of war in September 1939, the program was expanded. Adults with disabilities, chronic illnesses, mental health problems, and criminals who were not of German origin were included in the program. Six killing centers were established to speed up the process. The previous methods of killing people by lethal injection or starvation were deemed too slow to cope with large numbers of adults. The first experimental gassing took place at the killing center in Brandenburg, and thousands of disabled patients were killed in gas chambers disguised as shower rooms. The model used for killing to disabled people was later applied to the industrialized murder within Nazi concentration camps such as Auschwitz, Birkenau. Sorry if I don't pronounce the German words right. I, I am not German. It's not against the law. It's estimated that close to 250,000 disabled people were murdered under the Nazi regime. The Nazis really did kill a lot of people, and there is a lot of fascism that still exists throughout the world, particularly in Europe. And uh, so Italy, for example, has um, elected this person, Melanie, who is a far-right Italian woman and a, has been referred to as a fascist. Um, a few days ago, she was quoted as saying there is no reference to anti, an, anti-fascism. Sorry, I think it makes me really anxious to think about Nazism because I am really uh, not someone who supports fascism and I find it really terrifying that people are so hateful. So a few days ago, uh, this person who was a far right Italian politician said there's no reference to anti-fascism in the Italian constitution. So since the Holocaust and the end of the Holocaust, uh, there were a whole series of trials referred to as the Nuremberg trials. And no matter who you are in the world or where you are, what constitution you have or what language you have, or how much money you have, you cannot really be a Nazi and practice Nazism. So international law began because of the Nuremberg tribes. So between 1933 and 1945, Nazi Germany invaded many countries across Europe, inflicting 27 million deaths in the Soviet Union alone. Proposals for how to punish the defeated Nazi leaders ranged from a show trial, the Soviet Union, to summary executions, the United Kingdom. In mid-1945, France, the Soviet Union, the UK, and the US agreed to convene a joint tribunal in Nuremberg, occupied Germany, with the Nuremberg Charter as its legal instrument. Between 1920, I mean, sorry, between the 20th of November 1945 and the 1st of October 1946, the International Military Tribunal tried 21 of the most important surviving leaders of Nazi Germany, 
in the political, military, and economic spheres, as well as six German organizations. The purpose of the trial was not just to convict the defendants, but also to assemble irrefutable evidence of Nazi crimes, offer a history lesson to the defeated Germans, and delegitimize the traditional German elite. So there were many people who colluded with the Nazis, including Jewish people. One is not born as a fascist or an anti an anti-fascist, one becomes a fascist or an anti-fascist, and that is a matter of choice and personal conviction and political integrity and personal integrity. The International Military Tribunal and its charter marked the true beginning of international criminal law. The trial has met uh, a mixed reception raising from glorification to condemnation. So in the 1940s then, there were a lot of legal precedents set regarding fascism. And many people think that these precedents do not have to be revisited, but I would argue that they do. And this is particularly true uh, when there are cases where people with disabilities are discriminated against. So you can use the charter to argue against discrimination uh, of or against people with disabilities or ableism, but you can also look at all of the precedents that were set uh, after uh, the Holocaust ended and after uh, the Second World War. I think that the law is really important to study in this time period because there sometimes is not really an understanding of the law or the history of Nazism, the Holocaust, fascism, and all the legal precedents that were set after uh, really horrific uses of medicine to kill people with disabilities and to falsely diagnose people whom the Nazis wanted to kill as having, having a disability. These are just my thoughts from what I've read. Um, many people want to debate with me about historical facts after giving lectures regarding the Holocaust and fascism. Um, some of you are from other countries and you've learned other things and we can all have a debate, a scholarly debate, but we've all obviously read really different sources. As academic corollaries of minority civil rights movements, queer theory and disability studies both have origins in and ongoing commitments to activism. Their primary constituencies, sexual minorities and people, people with disabilities share a history of injustice. Both people, um, both have been pathologized by medicine, demonized by religion, discriminated against in housing, employment, and education, stereotype, stereo, stereotyped in representation, victimized by hate groups, and isolated socially, often in their families of origin. Both constituencies are diverse in terms of race, class, gender, sexuality, religion, political affiliation, and other respects, and therefore share many members, those who are disabled and gay, as well as allies. Both have self-consciously created their own enclaves and vibrant subcultural practices. I guess fascism makes me really nervous because I'm not a really controlling person who wants to have control over the whole world and other people's minds and bodies and sexual desires. I also don't want to be around people who have all of these controlling thoughts and cannot just let other people live their lives. 
Um, I also don't want to hoard money or try to do illegal business and steal things from people or only give people jobs uh, who look a certain way. It seems like a real annoyance um, to have to have all of these ideas of fascism or purity when someone could just do their own work and live their own life uh, and make their own choices and take responsibility for those choices. So the difference between these interrelated theories and disciplines is their radical stance towards concepts of normalcy. Both argue adamantly against the compulsion to observe norms of all kinds, corporeal, mental, sexual, social, cultural, subcultural. This stance may even be considered a raison d'etre, since both emerged from critiques leveled critiques levied against the normalizing tendencies of their antecedents. I guess I actually don't dislike other people and their existence. I often like people, um, but I don't really enjoy people pointing out what is wrong with others constantly or what is wrong with certain groups of people or implying that certain people don't have the right to make money or they're going to die because they'll never make money. I think it's really disturbing to my mental health. So I prefer uh, to talk to people who aren't not fascists, and I would prefer that people upheld the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and did not think about other uh, ideas of law, because we all have to follow the modern Canadian law. So the term cripple like queer is fluid and ever-changing, claimed by those whom it did not originally define. As a pejorative, the term queer was originally targeted at gays and lesbians. Yet its rearticulation as a term of pride is currently claimed by those who may not consider themselves homosexual, such as the transgender, transsexuals, heterosexual, sex radicals, and others. The term crip has expanded to include not only those with physical impairments, but those with sensory or mental impairments as well. Though I have never heard a non-disabled person seriously claim to be crip, as heterosexuals have claimed to be queer, I would not be surprised by this practice. The fluidity of both terms makes it likely that their boundaries will dissolve. So the point with these terms is not to create categories and then to police those categories. It, these terms are really fluid and um, they're actually just language that is used to reclaim derogatory ways of naming people. So the point with these categories is they're not really categories that exist or are fixed. Um, in the history of kind of hate crimes, people used these names when they were committing hate crimes against people who did not look the same as them or speak in the same way. Or, I mean, hate crime often just happens. Like if you've ever lived in a small Canadian town, sometimes groups of really bored, rich, white jocks have their parents' cars and they drive the cars around and look for people to beat up or call names. Um, people would often ask me if my one of my parents was black and use the n word or the slur that is most commonly used to refer to, to people who are black and uh one of my parents is not black but obviously this kind of visual difference from white chalk culture uh is what people saw and the same could be true of somebody who walks in a different way or someone who is chronically ill or as a speech impediment. Um, and so these terms, queer and crip, are often used uh, when people bash people or hurt people or make fun of people or ostracize people. And so the terms are not categories that someone uses to then 
make a million in the Canadian Canadian banking sector. Um, they're often just terms that people use to reclaim things that have been done to them. So this is a clip about queer phenomenology. I go tended to find a summer thing. Suddenly it's autumn. And we're still hanging out in winter. Maybe we'll forever. Find your seasonal thing or long-term thing on Tinder. It starts with a swipe. What makes a tree unforgettable? Do you know when you feel it? Make memories with it or gone. Unforgettable travel experiences. So this is a clip discussing queer phenomenology. When date night's on, but dinner isn't, find a recipe file for your Samsung Galaxy Z5. Canadian. Like, it doesn't surprise me that people are really bored. It doesn't surprise me that people the new Samsung attend to Galaxy all look the same way Prober. and Available on don't look any different. What's okay. interesting is that people kind of now try to hide this. Um, and so even if somebody wants to say things that they would have said in a rural town in their parents' car, they can't because of the law and efforts to make money. But I guess the history of Canada is all written. I mean, Canada has always been really racist. Nation building from Dominion onwards has involved white nation building and specifically trying to build a white Christian or Catholic country. If you grow up in Canada, people really do prefer to talk to people, especially women who are white with blonde hair and very thin and able-bodied and cisgender. None of this is surprising. I just don't know why anyone would really lie about it because people can continue to make money and hire who they want to hire. It's really difficult to prove that anything is against the law. Um, even if you make fun of people, you would really have to almost kill someone to go to jail. People can hire who they want and marry who they want and be friends who they want. There isn't really a need to lie. Again, today is actually the first time I'm recording in my new apartment in Montreal or Montreal for anyone who might not know what Montreal means. Uh, and yeah, today I want to talk about Sarah Ahmed's queer phenomenology. And the lighting might not be so good because I don't have all my stuff. I wasn't actually planning on doing this one, but I decided to anyways because... I have to go back to London. It's, it's all very chaotic. Now, before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guigno, G-U-I-G-N-I-O-N. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends who knows they might get a kick out of it. If you haven't done those things already and want to help me out, do them. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal if you're into that at all. Links in the description, or not, no pressure, of course. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form, so there shouldn't be any ads, which is like so many people are like, the, the ads, find it in podcast form, then you can download it, listen to it, however many times you like without any ads. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube, but there is also a video. So if you're into that, uh, you can go and find that there. And yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's talk about... Sarah Ahmed's Queer Phenomenology. Now, I've covered this text in its entirety. So you can go and find episodes on that. And I've also done, uh, I think, one other Ahmed text. I think I've done The Cultural Politics of Emotion, maybe, uh, which you can go and listen to. I'm obviously a big fan of Ahmed's work. But I, I just want to talk today about this term, queer phenomenology. And in order to do that, it's important to really begin with the term phenomenology, which is where Ahmed says that she begins. Now, she aligns her version of phenomenology, at least its history, with Edmund Husserl. Now, Edmund Husserl is kind of a forgotten figure, and I'm saying that with a big asterisk, uh, kind of really emphasizing that, that term, kind of, because he was writing at the time similarly to at the time similarly to Heidegger, so he kind of fell under Heidegger's shadow a little bit, but he was a pretty notable phenomenologist, and he had some pretty uh, strong political leanings that, given the what was going on in Europe at the time. He was obviously trying to understand these political movements uh, through his own philosophical work, through phenomenology. Now, 
the history of phenomenology is one that is difficult to really pin down. So you have phenomenology from Husserl, from Kant to Husserl, Heidegger, Fanon. You have all of these kinds, Merleau-Ponty, South. You have all of these different branches that can, different figures that can fit into the camp of phenomenology, and they are hardly congruent. They are hardly the same. So in order to really understand how Ahmed is approaching this, I think it's important, or I'm going to give you some basic points that I think will get us off the ground. And that is that phenomenology is, in its simplest form, the study of appearances and how people, humans, interact with things in the world as they come in contact with us through our senses, through our uh, ability to touch them, see them, smell them, how they appear to us through all of these different senses. And phenomenology is the study of those interactions, how we interact with things in, in their immediacy, and how we think about them, reflect upon them, how things become meaningful to us. So in this way, phenomenology is kind of a, it claims to be a kind of neutral enterprise, one that is just describing the experiences that all humans undergo. And that is the experience of experience, the very capacity to have engagement with things and, and others in the world. And this sets up the possibility of consciousness to some extent. It sets up the ability, the ability of emotions. Now, phenomenology claims itself to be a pretty neutral enterprise, as, as I've just said. But there are moments where it challenges that neutrality to some extent, going as far back as Kant, for example, who in the third critique, when discussing the sublime and discussing versus the beautiful, he lays out the potential that is afforded by certain phenomena, like uh, being confronted with a, a mountain, for example, or a great storm that has the capacity to elicit a response within humans that is different if you were to just come into contact with a wall or with uh, a cupboard door that doesn't have the same kind of emotional baggage or doesn't elicit the same kind of emotional response. So we are, as humans, Seems, seems that we are oriented towards different objects in different ways. We just have different responses to them. But while in no way focused on Kant, Ahmed performs a similar function in that she interrogates how some objects seem to draw us in more than others. Why are we oriented towards some objects in certain ways versus others in other ways? So to go back to Husserl, who had much more of an influence on her in this text, there's a moment in Husserl when Husserl is meditating on the existence of his writing table, where he sits to write and think. Now, he meditates on this writing table to say that, you know, he has a phenomenolo phenomenological engagement with this table. He views the table, he gives that table an appearance, which then has some kind of effect on him and induces some kind of emotion. And he says that he knows that while he's not necessarily looking at other things, he knows that there are things around him too. So it isn't just what you are immediately attuned to that you are aware of. So I'm looking right now at the camera, does not mean that I'm not aware of the fact that there are other things around me. And you have to attune yourself to spaces in order to be comfortable, to feel at home, to feel at ease. So there is that capacity there, this capacity to see things that are kind of out of your purview. But Ahmed asks, well, how do we choose what these things are that we see? So she says that in order for Husserl to have this writing table, in order for him to even engage in phenomenology, depends upon largely the labor of his wife, cleaning his table, preparing his meals, getting things ready for him, or servants or, or whoever, to get things ready for him, in order for him to even have this phenomenological experience, and to even meditate upon that phenomenological experience to put forward his whole philosophy. So Ahmed asks, what is forgotten here in our experiencing the world, and certainly in the phenomenological tradition, in our meditating on it? What objects can enter into the phenomenological arena, and what objects get pushed away or get disavowed? So she says that Insofar as phenomenology, despite its claim to just study neutrally phenomena in the world, things that humans come in contact with, engage with, and sense, 
Ahmed says that phenomenology is always, to some extent, kind of queer in that it doesn't only point in a single neutral direction. It instead picks and chooses some things to understand, to grasp over others. It is quite skewed in that way. It doesn't just assume a single linear form. It, drawing upon certain histories, be it histories of colonization, of patriarchy, of racism, all of these histories are going to influence what phenomenology is even capable of recognizing and what it is not capable of recognizing. Now, it's the natural durability that's born to perform. Plastic free, aluminium free. It's been so effective, effective, that it has erased this fact that the very phenomenological project is one that is going to be culturally, historically, socially determined. So Ahmed says, well, why don't we just really embrace the fact that it is not? We know full well that phenomenology is going to be biased, it is going to be skewed. So let us now consider instead how we can integrate those different perspectives. How can we expand the category of phenomenology to actually account for its own skewedness, its own queerness, but do it to undo the very specific skewedness that we have, one that favors largely in the case that she's describing uh, white hetero men, how can we expand this to include differing perspectives? So in the case of, for example, race, she says that spaces are organized in such a way as to favor certain races over others, or same can apply to gender or disability versus able-bodied people who have an easier time moving through the world. Ahmed's vision is to rethink phenomenology to such an extent as to consider the ways that the world is not organized to actually accommodate all people in a neutral way, but in fact only reflects the interests of those who are in power. And that world is then, that world then conforms to them and they feel comfortable in it. They're able to move freely and easily through it. And because of that, it is all the more difficult for them to recognize that there is anything wrong at all, especially in the case of disability where something like the height of doorknobs just feels totally normal for able-bodied people of a certain height but for people that might have difficulty actually using doorknobs suddenly what just appears to be a thing in the world that we don't even think about we don't even meditate on is suddenly a huge hindrance it's a huge barrier to one's moving through the world and so the operation of queering phenomenology is to actually be able to break out of this neutral mindscape in order to enter into the possibility, in order to consider the possibility that some spaces, some experiences, some appearances aren't really so neat as to just lend themselves to our senses and can actually be huge hindrances. They can actually be huge limitations for certain people. And the phenomenological engagement that they'll have with it is not a neutral one. It's actually one that is quite difficult, one that is one that presents a barrier to circumvent. So queer phenomenology is the practice then of considering how certain spaces, certain objects have been given the status of neutrality, of objectivity, but then undoing that just by following through with what phenomenology has always done. It has always been about certain perspectives, certain orientations, certain objects, and having them be neutral, having to be accessible versus others being unaccessible, being uncomfortable. And she describes how those people who are uh, enjoy comfort in the world just sit in a chair. They're just like they're sitting in a chair that conforms perfectly to them. While for others whose bodies aren't so privileged as to be able to, as to have the world conform to them, sit in this seemingly comfortable chair for those privileged people but then find it to be quite uncomfortable because it does not match their actual needs. It doesn't match their actual phenomenological engagement with the world in a neutral, clear way. And yeah, that's pretty well it, pretty short-ish thing. If you want more on it, like I said, I've covered the whole text. You can go check that out. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Um, if you want to see more of my apartment, you probably will with time. I haven't found an actual place to record yet, uh, hence my sitting on my bed with the weird background but i'll figure that all out with time uh and yeah take care hey mac users 
Have you noticed your MacBook's getting a little slower to respond or your fans are getting noisier? So Margaret Sheldrick is a scholar of critical disability studies. I think it should be CDS, sorry. When I post these online, I'll make sure that the spelling mistakes are corrected as much as I can. Um, so Margaret Sheldrick writes, I want to set up some ambitious claims for critical disability theory to highlight its efficacy and its inevitability. Where where feminism, post-colonial studies, and queer theory have in the recent past all helped us to think and therefore act differently, I believe that CDS can now take up that task. So it's interesting to think about how there are these theoretical kind of trends or theoretical movements. Um, you could say trends or movements, whatever you, you I don't, it, it, what I mean is uh, at certain moments in time, certain theoretical traditions gain prominence. And it's a way that people who are often left-wing, um, those who often believe in a strong social welfare state and who care about the rights of the most marginalized and who believe that the most marginalized people um, are not those who should be held in contempt always. Uh, mm -hmm. So these different theoretical traditions um, often gain prominence at different times. And so Critical disability studies has gained a lot of prominence, specifically in this time where we're constantly judged in relation to productivity and perfection in terms of uses of technology, self-presentation in the workforce, being on time, um, speaking and writing perf in, in perfect ways over email. And when people have a disability, this kind of perfection, firstly, is my, it, it might not be achievable. Like if someone is chronically ill or has a disability that prevents them from accessing certain spaces or it takes longer on public transportation, um, it takes longer to access certain spaces, then this kind of perfection of time uh, might not be possible. But the other question goes back to Nazism and fascism and why being quote unquote perfect matters. Um, the other questions we could ask is who actually sets these standards and rules? Who uh, orders our time? And it takes us back to Michel Foucault who's written extensively about um,
modes of authority that involve trying to govern people's bodies and order people's senses of time. So who has the right to intervene in someone's human body and tell them uh, where to go and when? Um, who has the right to judge what is perfect speech um, or pleasing embodiments or who has the actual right to judge what is a healthy life or what is mental or physical health. And these ideas of who judges, I think, need to take us back to the Nazis because in a different time, Nazism and fascism allowed a certain group of people to judge and they judged to the extent that they killed millions of people. Um, and they also judged religious minorities queer people and people with just people with disabilities um, as those who are not fit to live a life. So Anita Guy is my friend and colleague in India. And Anita Guy is a professor in Delhi, New Delhi, India, which is the capital of India. And Anita Guy has written about the rights of people with disabilities in India and specifically women with disabilities in India. India, often described as an emerging superpower, has a population of 1 billion, out of which approximately 70 million are characterized as disabled. Public consciousness of the issues and concerns that affect the lives of those with disabilities is a fairly recent phenomenon. It was only in the 49th year of India's independence, the first legislation advocating equal rights for disabled people came into effect. In Hindi, the phrase women with disabilities means one a girl that is too disabled. This intermingling of disablement and gender, writes Guy, marks the reality of a woman with a disability in India. Consequently, both con congenital and acquired disabilities for the girl child are seen as additional rather than initial liabilities. Opportunities for improving the quality of life of a disabled girl are virtually non-existent. Already living a life of subordination without education and employment, women can do without the burden, burden of disability. As a mother lamented, wasn't it enough that we have a hand-to-mouth existence? Why did God have to add to punish us further by giving a langry, crippled daughter. So this idea that God has punished someone is also really about caste. And Anita Guy writes about the ways that caste and casteism and the caste system leads to the pathologization and violence against women with disabilities in India. So if one believes in caste as a part of Hinduism and if, uh, if you believe that you were born as an upper caste Hindu um, as a gift from God or as your God's chosen person in the same way that Nazis believe they're God's chosen people and lots of people believe that they're special um, and not special in the way that people often are described who have disabilities special like a perfect person, um, then you would I guess, believe that uh, God also has done something to someone who is not like you. And so if you are God's chosen person and you should have the most money, you should be thought to be the most beautiful, you should be given the most privileges, then those who are not like you should also be uh, criminalized or not allowed to be part of society. And the caste system then uh, is organized around the exchange of women. And we can even return to an essay by Gail Rubin, 
about the exchange of women, which was a really old feminist essay. And um, it's a kind of classic feminist essay. Um, and it's a very good essay about the ways that societies exchange women in order to reproduce certain classes and castes and religions and races of people. And women with disabilities then are often seen to not have the capacity to reproduce uh, an upper caste Hindu lineage because part of being, say, a perfect Hindu is also about uh, hiding any health problems you have or hiding any mental health or physical health issues you have and pretending to have a perfect body to reproduce uh, certain groups of people. So Anita Guy states that any deviation from a normally accepted archetype is seen as a marked deviation. The impaired body becomes a symbolic symbol of imperfection. The myth of the beautiful body defines the impaired female body as feminine and unacceptable. Disability is thus constituted as being profoundly of other in our society. So this is a clip of Anita Guy, my friend and colleague. In her 2002 article, Integrating Disability, Transforming Feminist Theory, Feminist Critical Disability Studies scholar Rosemary Garland. Okay, sorry, this is the wrong. I made a mistake. Um, I'll play this clip of Anita Guy discussing women with disabilities in India. logistics related announcements to make so that we can create a smooth and pleasant experience for everyone. Um, you might have noticed that all of your microphones have been muted. They will be muted through the session. Any questions uh, to the speaker, uh, please feel free to... I'm going to skip ahead. This is usually a long intro. So this is Anita Guy. We don't have that much time. Sorry. When I post the slides, I'll post this clip. I'll fix the part. And and disable. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. And I feel very, very honored to be a part of uh, such a center where both research as well as uh, uh, academia and and disabled uh, people would be uh, would be the stakeholders and together they would kind of move on. Um, I'm really thankful to Dr. Sadhgopan and Amitji and everyone. Um, and uh, let me let me just simply start by saying that uh, people who really like technology, I am kind of a cyborg, you know, because I uh, I have a motorized wheelchair, which actually makes me, you know, uh, very, very mobile. And of course, a lot of people who kind of envy me that uh, this 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 mobility uh, uh, sometimes is very problematic for uh, uh, many people. So um, let me uh, begin with uh, my uh, talk, which is uh, on on disability studies uh, and technology, as well as I 
end up with going into post-humanism uh, and, and some questions that, that are raised by uh, um, uh, Rosa Braidotti specifically. So uh, let me start. Uh, Disability-like questions of race, gender, caste, and class is one of the most stimulating topics among scholars who have interest in marginality. In my understanding, the comprehension meaning of disability in India has been understood as embedded in multiple cultural discourses that are subtly nuanced. In today's presentation, I would like to focus on the significance of understanding disability as knowledge production um, with the recognition that situated knowledge emerges from disability too. Experience too. The genesis of disability studies reflects not only the pain and anguish of disabled lives, but also the resistance to oppression inherent in living with a label, which evokes and attaches a negative value to lack, deficit, as well as difference. The normative culture, both in India and the world over, carries existential and aesthetic anxieties about difference of any kind, be it caste, class, gender, or disability. This leads to a creation of living reality of acute marginalization, discrimination, and stigmatization. Consequently, my research and practice have led to the evolution and legitimation of disability studies as a discipline. Before I underscore the potential of disability studies, let me foreground some of the challenges that I have led to the development of disability studies. As a disabled woman with a visible impairment and, and a cyborg, uh, my own location in the field is complicated as my subject position is relevant to anyone researching disability. So the questions that emerge are, uh, are as follows. For example, what is my stance as an activist or academician? With what authority can I speak about disability and disability studies? What is the politics of my epistemic privilege and why? Am I speaking with disabled people or about them? What language do I use to describe disability? Who has the power to name and label? How does understanding of disability studies exclude others from speaking out? How should I negotiate with the issues of diagnosis and certification? Perhaps the simplest way to think of emergence of the field is to identify disability studies as the academic side of disability rights movement and the UN convention. The political theorist Michael Walzer has concisely characterized social criticism as the educated cousin of the common complaint to make his argument that effective social theory must never move far uh, from the very real problems faced by uh, people. So disability studies in an interdisciplinary field of study concerned with the representation of the concepts, culture, and personal experiences of disability in all its variations. Disability studies in the West and some universities in India, uh, including mine, are already tackling the multiplicity of the goals of disability studies. One way in which this is being done is to mark out the differences from other fields as the term disability studies cannot be a substitute for uh, special education or rehab sciences. My understanding is that disability studies is complete, uh, is compatible with community support and inclusive education. But the main concern is not think of community support and inclusive education as proxies for DS or the other way around, DS as a proxy for the other two. Though there is some movement from the religious, charitable, medical, and the social framed in cultural context, an understanding of disability as legitimate knowledge is still missing. People-oriented movements have highlighted oppressive structures and foregrounded the rights of marginalized communities. However, these voices do not include the knowledge base of disability. Both academics as well as activists work on the assumption that there are far more serious issues, such that of survival, that need attention, as if disabled people should wait their turn until the issue of poverty and employment are fully sorted out. It may be noted that all marginalized identities, such as gender or caste, suffer this problem of not being recognized in mainstream issues, but that disability is more marginal even within the marginalized. It is important to realize that the study of disability should question not only the issues of medical cure or rehab, 
but also conceptualize disability as a social category on par with gender, class, caste, race, and sexual orientation. Disability studies has not been privileged within academia, perhaps because understanding of disability is intimately connected to the study of ignorance. How and why various forms of knowing related to disability have not come to be or disappeared or have been delayed or long neglected for better or worse at various points in history. Absence of disability from the mainstream academia creates and maintains a status quo where the disability is incorporated within the existing social patterns as a problem. Disability does remains an out and out state, both politically and academically. It is the source of its own oppression. Such an understanding suggests that more is at stake than a problematizing discourse of specific categories. By not exploring this relationship, higher education at large has delimited inquiry and pursuit of knowledge of disability. Possibly the reason is that schools, colleges, and universities across communities remain sites where not only knowledge, but also a middle-class orientation with its patriarchal, neoliberal, and normative values are produced and reproduced. An academic understanding of disability as a social, cultural, and political phenomenon is central to counter the notion uh, as an, of, of disability as an inherent, unchallengeable trait located in the individual. Such an approach rejects the view that disability is solely a medical problem or a personal tragedy. Disability studies thus places the responsibility for re-examining and repositioning the place of disability within society, not on the individual, but on academia as well as society itself. Disability studies may be many things to many people, but if its full potential is to be realized, then it must avoid being seen as simply old wine in a new bottle, perhaps. The purpose of making disability studies an academic discipline is to create a body of knowledge which can provide orientations towards rethinking and reflecting upon aspects of our comprehension of disability and social marginalization. Disability studies exist at the uneven boundaries of the social, the concurrently rebellious and the celebratory in its insistence that disability is neither tragedy nor inspiration, but a satisfying and enjoyable way of being in the world, even if only the ablest world would not get in the way. Just like the unforeseen possibilities of a new day, reflecting on the field of disability studies is also loaded with the unknown. For instance, knowledge of disability has to be engaged in the unlearning of the traditional thinking privilege so that disability helps us rethink the concept of marginality itself. It offers us a position to learn to one another, but it also helps one to learn to speak in such a way that renegotiates our relationships between the margin and the center. Disability studies help us rewrite the relationship between the edge and the epicenter in academia as well as activism. There are no easy answers to this never ending questions of identity and interconnections. There is no easy way of drawing boundaries, who should be in and who should be out. No easy inventory of heterogeneity of innumerable disability communities both as an academician and advocate, I believe that disability studies make these questions relevant to everyone, whether they identify as disabled or not at any given time. It seems to me that identity is not an ideal insertion into political discourse. Rather, it has critical implications for how discipline of disability studies can expand and thrive within academia. As an insider, I find that ideas are wide ranging and the most radical reimagining of possibilities. They produce few answers, but rather embrace the practice of constantly troubling the questions. They make even the radical seem quite conservative. For instance, take any theory 
humanism, psychoanalysis, Marxism, critical theory, feminist theory, LGBT, queer theory. You bring disability studies in myths and post questions such as what are the conceptions of the normal? What is autonomy? When exactly is life not worth living? Why does rationality have to be the sole determinant of our humanity? How do we define limits of humanity? Does disability studies embody unsettling ideas that refuse to disappear? The promise of disability studies is that it can renew attention of the disembodied and embodied beings that very often utilize their bodies as a means of organizing insights regarding the circumstances surrounding them. One undercurrent that the potential of enriching lives of persons with disabilities is assistive technology. I would call it AT if it's okay. Uh, connect with people and provide a means of access to education, commerce, employment, and entertainment. Assistive technology in the global north functions on the principle that independence and access is equal to the that is equal to the mainstream society is the desired end goal of people with disability. Communication technologies and new media promise to revolutionize our lives by breaking down barriers. This is by Gauguin, a uh, quote. And expanding access for people, for disabled people. Uh, to me, technology is often branded as redeeming and presumably allowing each person to outcome, uh, uh, to overcome the social, educational and physical barriers. Like a perfect understanding, technology assures us read person with disability to unshackle us from the confines of embodiment and provide us with a revolutionary antidote for impairment. The fantasy is that disability would simply fade away or become a largely insig insignificant difference. A powerful implication reflected in these is that assistive technology is in particular complement the playing field. However, I believe the relationship between technology and access is contradictory. Let me underscore the fact that technology can also isolate people, creating unique forms of social exclusion. A case of education in COVID is an example. A farmer sells a cow to buy a smartphone to get his son educated. Mm -hmm. These exclusions are more powerful for persons with disabilities as the discursive practices around assistive technology in school and college settings where technology is matched to student impairments is, is problematic. Segregation, however, can be subtler. Technology, for instance, privileges particular ways of being which are grounded in the normative, social, cultural, and e economic practices further in design, manufacture, marketing, and implementation of technology. In other words, technology is designed in ways that reflect uh, that reflect taken for granted ideas about what constitutes normal. This assertion is being questioned by scholars in the global south as the context is critically divergent as persons with disability primarily rely on their familial and community, community ties for their everyday life and not as government programs or public resources, even if legally mandated. These ideas about how we should operate are embedded within technology and are reflective of an ability expectation worldview, one, uh, that would, uh, one that would view, for example, a cochlear implant as a desirable and necessary technological advancement over deafness, which would be perceived from this vantage point as pathological and disabling, rather than as a linguistic minority identity reflective of a deaf culture. Technology is very much a part of larger social con uh, context. Such normative assumptions about how bodies are supposed to operate are deeply entrenched in all aspects of technology. Moreover, these ideologies of ability and normalcy are imbricated 
in our thinking and practices that we often fail to notice their patterns, authorities, contradictions, and influence. One of the fellow uh, disabled Tobin Cybers, who is no more. Thus, the global South will have to rethink of the design of assistive technology solutions for these from the bottom up, taking up the social context and the existing networks uh, of support around persons with disabilities. For us, affordability is important, but we have to think about the identity issues as well. In global South, a compulsion for technological answers to inaccessibility may represent a shift from the responsibility of society to remove barriers to full participation in society, uh, or to require individuals with, and to submit a technological fix. In a way, assistive technology could be thought of as promoting a form of what McRuder calls compulsory able-bodiedness where individuals are coerced to rely on technology to comply with the able-bodied norms rather than challenging the boundaries of what is considered as normal. This kind of thinking also uh, is important that there is technology that is designed for disab disabled people and technology designed for presumed non-disabled people mm -hmm. and more notably that the latter need not be uh, accessible because of the former. My suggestion is that design of new technology for people with disabilities should neither be driven incrementally simply by the incorporation of accessibility features into mainstream technology, nor through a function-driven approach that ignores the experience of technological use. I come across inaccessible websites, media, and electronic forums. Technology can also result in unexpected and often understated forms of exclusion. The fact that technology can isolate people happens when a student is encouraged or required to take an online course rather than a course on campus that students risk being further isolated from social opportunities available to students who take courses in campus. Isolation can be apparent in ways that accessibility is approached as a retrofit or add-on to accessibility rather than being a meaningful working of the infrastructure. The implication is that costly accessible options are always one step behind whatever technology is being nurtured for mainstream market. I often think of pirated JAWS software being used as software uh, is, is very expensive. Devices designed to pose solution to problems falling into what Hendren calls narrow functioning trap that serve to empower users through what their technology can enable them to accomplish. From a disability studies standpoint, I, I argue how the varied ways people engage with their devices are ignored when certain technologies are coded to allow disabled people to participate in society. For instance, specific devices using associated with disability can lead to feelings of stigmatization by the users, for example, the hearing aids. Thus, assistive technology represents, tends to associate with a medicalized technological design that could, could have been more socially minded and inclusive as all technology assists everybody in some fashion or the other. Wolbrink, a fellow disabled and his colleagues, give a concrete example. Brain machine interfaces, uh, BMI, or brain computer interfaces, BCI, is seen as a useful for many disabled people, including many having ASD, visual impairment, or hearing impairments. However, the academic literature overwhelming covers disabled people as a user within a medical framework. Thus, the bias evident in the imagery of disabled people is particularly revealing in the BMI and BCI example, because uh, both are also created for the non-disabled users also. Yet technologies developed to maintain the status quo of normative efficiency are not usually attentive to alternative experiences outside, the, outside of full mastery. I would underscore the fact that purchase costs not only include the price of devices such as hi-fi motorized wheelchairs, 
but also cost for services and training needs associated with the technology, an aspect often disregarded. Close to home, disabled people have been highly critical of prenatal screening and selective abortion, seeing them as a new strategy of eugenics. New reproductive techniques reinforce the notion that there is an ideal that humanity must aspire for. Such a position looks at disability as deficit. However, this approach is like a slippery slope to other forms of selection and thus eventually to a world of new designer baby eugenics. In this view, disability offers a way of resisting homogenization. What is required is political work, which can reflect on the social values and structural inequities that promote choices. I had come across Joy G. Paul and Manohar Swaminathan's recent work on a new technology for assistive technology. The latter started working on uh, technologies for people with visual vision impairments about four years ago, moving to the area with the background in virtual and augmented reality technologies. And predictably, the early projects were focused on the disabled in the global north. For example, uh, the indoor navigation uh, for persons with visual impairments was uh, evident. Another ongoing, ongoing project, project is to make mainstream video games accessible to uh, persons with visual impairment using immersive spatial audio. But bringing uh, Georgie's background on disability studies, they evolved a new approach known as the ludic design for accessibility. They propose the notion of ludic design as a framework to rethink accessibility, specifically building on past work on play and enjoyment in the process of interaction with the world around oneself. The key premise is that play and playfulness are central to what makes us human and that by separating playfulness and exploration from the design experience, we fail the intended end users of our products. They have been appearing the ludic design methodology uh, to introduce digital skills and computational thinking for children who are visually impaired. Early results of the work uh, are, are, are reported in, in, in the research plan. These projects involve a diverse set of researchers, including two that are blind, working with children and many teachers who are also visually impaired. One of the early insights from their work for me is that play and playfulness appear to actually thrive when faced with factors which are normally viewed as deficiencies and challenges in the global South. Finally, I want to mention Rosie Bryadotti's book, The Post-Human, that inspired scholars to argue for a post-human disability studies. Goodley, again a close friend, have argued, and a very well-known disability scholar, have argued that disability studies is perfectly at ease with the post-human in criticizing the ideal of the humanity that was implicitly assumed to be masculine, white, urbanized, speaking a standard language, heterosexually inscribed in a reproductive unit and a full citizen of a recognized polity. I do appreciate Bredotti's aim not only to destabilize humanist man, men and women, but also to look for options in response to the oppressive nature of humanism and to rethink our relationships with our environments, our world, human and non-human inhabitants of our planet. Using Rosie Bryadotti's understanding, I will underscore three aspects that are critical to disabled lives. First is life beyond the self. Second is life beyond the species. And finally, life beyond death. For Bryadotti, matter is not dialectically opposed to culture, nor to technological meditation, but continues with them. So contemporary science and biotechnologies affect the very fiber and structure of the living and have altered dramatically our understanding of what counts the basic frame of reference 
for human today. Gregorti suggests that thinking is about the invention of new concepts and new productive ethical relations. In this respect, theory is a form of methodical separation from dominant values. Disability therefore encapsulates the creative possibilities of the post-human condition. Thus, a political and critical edge is brought to the post-humanist theory. While disabled people will continue to fight to be recognized as humans uh, in the humanist sense and register of humanism, but equally and simultaneously are already enacting form of activism, art and rationality that pushes everyone to think imaginatively and critically about a new epoch that we might term the post-human. Disability disavows the human, it desires and rejects it, and in this dynamic necessarily contradictory play with the human. Disability allows thinking again about technological relationships and politics. Thus, technological me mediation cannot be given up. The question- Okay, I'm gonna stop it there. I'll post the entire talk uh, in your PowerPoint in the interest of time. I'll stop it there. Um, and I think it's interesting to think about this idea of the limits of the human. And it's something that a lot of critical disability scholars discuss, what constitutes humanity. And the mention of eugenics is, uh, again, important. And it's something we've discussed throughout the class um, that who can or cannot embody the figure of the human, who has firstly the right to life itself, but then who is entitled to a certain quality of life um, has been central to the questions we've asked in the course. And we've talked about forced sterilization of in indigenous women in Turtle Island or Canada um, and throughout Canada. And these questions are really about the limits of the human. We've also discussed Marxism and the ways that people who are poor are often pushed to this boundary of humanity and inhumanity. So if you do not have enough money for housing, if you don't have enough money for food, if you live in poverty, then uh, you are a citizen, but what upholds your humanity? So many scholars have discussed the body and the way that the human body is encoded with meaning um, about our social reality. Speak, to speak of the body as representing encoded social meanings as an image of society or even a metaphor for society. The question remains whether these perspectives could acknowledge the materiality of bodies, not merely as they are formed or represented in a culture, but how they constitute the lived reality of persons. Through this analysis takes up issues of cultural spaces in the female body. There is no mention of the disabled body. This omission reflects the historical practice that con continues to render, render the disabled invisible in a manner very similar to the in, in invisibility experienced by Blacks in a white society. As Robert Young argues, in a racist society is necessary for the African-American subject to be rendered invisible in order to enable the Euro-American subject whiteness to preserve the illusion of autonomy, rationality, and control. Aravel's application of this analysis to disability pursues a similar argument. She says that a non-disabled subject upon encountering its other, the disabled subject, finds it necessary to suppress the memory of this deviant image in order to support the illusion of normalcy and wholeness. Now, these claims that normalcy or wholeness are themselves illusions becomes, visibly, becomes vividly apparent when one examines how constructions of a normative self are in fact predicated on the existence of the disabled other. So forgetting about people with disabilities is central to ableism, um, not remembering 
who people with disabilities are, the existence of people with disabilities is similar to not remembering the existence of people of color. And I discuss Nazism and eugenics in detail. So finally, I'll finish by discussing queer crip artist and Yayo Post Gusama. So Carrie Sandel states that because queer and crip communities share constituents, it is hardly surprising that some queer performance artists are also disabled, or that the material and ideological particularities of being disabled nuance those associated with solo performance. For many disabled artists, however, the economic constraints are even more debilitating than they are for non-disabled artists. For queer performers, Visibility often means proclaiming an otherwise invisible sexual on stage, sexuality on stage. The task is different for disabled performers whose visible impairments often lead to social invisibility. Here I mean social invisibility both metaphorically, as in non-disabled people's lack of regard for disabled people, and literally, as in disabled people's lack of access to public spaces. Social invisibility extends to academic theater training programs, mostly of which base admission on a young person's talent, by which they mean the ability to enact a set of virtuistic physical and verbal skills. Desiring a messier matter version of Kusama, right, these authors who discuss Yayo Kusama, the Japanese artist, we turn to Martha Zerzika and Damatilla Oliveri's Affective Encounters, Tools of Interruption for Activist Media Practices. How do cultural, artistic, and media practices participate in the distribution of affects and feelings? How, as media participants, can we use these affects and feelings and strategies of persistence, resistance, or subversion? Responding to this call to take seriously and playfully the feminist potential of affect encounters, we attend to nuances of crip feminist identity in the mediated mad art of Kusama. So who is she? Yayo Kusama is a Japanese artist who is sometimes called the princess of polka dots. Although she makes lots of different types of art, paintings, sculptures, performances, and installations, they have one thing in common, dots. Yayu Kusama tells the story of how, when she was a little girl, she had a hallucination that freaked her out. She was in a field of flowers when they all started talking to her. The heads of the flowers were like dots that went on as far as she could see. And she felt as if she was disappearing or what she calls self-obliterating into this field of endless dots. This was a weird experience influenced most of, and that influenced most of her later work. By adding all of her marks and dots to her paintings, drawings, objects, and clothes, she feels as if she is making them and herself melt into and become part of our bigger universe. She said, our earth is only one polka dot among a million stars in the cosmos. Polka dots are a way of in to infinity. When we obliterate nature and our bodies with polka dots, we become part of the unity of our environment. When Japanese artist Yayoi Kusama first moved to New York City. She stood at the top of the Empire State Building and made a promise to herself. She would become world famous for her paintings, her sculptures, and her extraordinary creative energy. She was thousands of miles away from home and she finally felt free. Yayoi was born in Matsumoto, a city in Japan surrounded by mountains and nature. Her parents owned a seed nursery which grew flowers to sell across the country. 
Yayoi would sit in the flower beds with her sketchbook and get lost in her imagination. She knew, even when she was very young, that she wanted to be an artist. But her parents were against the idea. At the time, most artists in Japan were men. Yayoi's mum wanted Yayoi to become a housewife. They got into terrible fights, but Yayoi was rebellious and unstoppable. When her mum snatched away her canvases, she used old sacks instead. One day, Yayoi was sitting in the flower beds when all the flowers seemed to come to life. Their heads were like dots that went on as far as she could see. She felt as if she was being obliterated or breaking into little pieces and disappearing into a field of endless dots. After Yayoi got home, she sketched lots and lots of the never-ending fields of flowers and what she'd seen in the field. Drawing helped her to feel calmer and more in control. She could break herself into dots or self-obliterate and become one with her surroundings. She also used dots to connect with other people, like in this drawing of her mum. A few years later, Yayoi saw the work of a famous and much older artist called Georgia O'Keeffe, who lived across the world in America. She decided to send Georgia a letter and some watercolour paintings she'd made. To her surprise, Georgia replied and even said she showed the watercolours to her art dealer. The letter was the start of a new adventure. Yayoi would later write, if Georgia had not answered my letter, I'm not sure I would ever have made it to America. It was because of her that I was able to go to the USA and begin my artist career in earnest. When Yayoi was 27 years old, she packed 2,000 drawings into her suitcase and got on a plane. Away from her parents, she could paint from morning to night. She worked on giant canvases and became known for putting dots on walls, on clothes, on people, even on a horse. Yayoi found lots of fans who wanted her to paint dots on their bodies so they could become a part of her artworks. She finally met Georgia O'Keeffe in person and made friends with other famous American artists, including Andy Warhol, Joseph Cornell, and Donald Judd. But like in Japan, most of the artists in New York were men. Yayoi had to work extra hard to stand out. And sometimes this would leave her feeling exhausted and anxious. But making art was a safe space for her where she could feel at peace. Now in her 90s, Yayoi is famous around the world for her work, just like she promised herself that day at the Empire State Building. She sees herself as a single dot and everyone in the world is a dot connected to another dot. Our earth is like one little polka dot among millions of other celestial bodies she once wrote. Let's forget ourselves and become one with the universe. When do you feel most connected with the world? And what would that look like in a drawing? Do these authors discuss this exhibition and they write critically about it and they said that we are interested in reading for the material embodied traces of pain tension resistance and a, a emotional disability that run through kusama's work and life behind the myth of kusama is a laboring body mind the labor of managing unruliness and distress through psychiatry and medication and long periods of rest of struggling with the very matter of selfhood as in the autobiographical commemoration photo shoot, where she images herself as fractured and displaced into a group of 14 polka dot faced women. 
of performing a consumable mad genius identities and Asian women working in a field that privileges able-bodiedness, whiteness, and masculinity, and of taking a limit and turning it into the very thing that makes her work undeniably unique and powerful. Underneath the glittering larger than life photograph of Kusama that watches us as we move to the labyrinth gallery and the sweaty, more complicated, harder to articulate labor of a disabled Japanese woman seeking to make her mark and gain cultural authority in the art world across several geopolitical contexts, Japanese, American, global, that have never been especially welcoming to women, disabled bodies, or people of color. We want to illuminate the threads of pain that run through this research project, psychic pain, physical pain, the pain that is performed in practice through Yayo Kusama's art, the pain that is mirrored and transformed through the shifting lenses of social media and selfie culture. We want to explore what it means to live and work in a body in pain and to work with a body of work that emerges around pain. Where is that pain located in the encounters of screen technology art galleries and social media. Busama writes that artists do not usually express their own psychological complexes directly, but I do use my complexes and fears as subjects. I make them and make them and keep on making them until I bury myself in the process. I call this obliteration. What if rather than say obliterate pain, we brush the dirt from, from its buried body and allow it to speak? What might it say? So I'll finish with this idea of cripping the museum in the interest of time. Kusama is troubling, uh, a troubling feminist figure and an evasive larger than life celebrity and is not explicitly attached to a critical mad, mad and disability discourse. So in this paper, the authors offer a mad crip account of Kusama's exhibition, decomposing the idea of the mad genius and or historical frigid woman, moving the story more emphatically into the realm of crip creativity and cripping the museum. While a physical and Digital extensions of the exhibition tried to elicit participation in normative and normalizing ways. Critically crip moments of productive tension ruptured the smooth lines of power and ideology in the institution. Through a series of personal reflections, we showcase the potential for affective encounters between bodies in both virtual and material spaces to disrupt ableist and sanest norms. So I'll post the article that is written about Kusama online as a recommended reading. If you're interested in uh, looking at these topics for your presentation, and the article might be useful. And it's called Encounters with Kusama. Disability Feminism and the Mediated Mad Art of Infinite Kusama. And it's written by A. Jarriet Poole and S. Brophy. And it was written in 2021. So I'll post it online in case you're interested in this as a topic for your presentation, which is coming up as a deadline. Or a due date, if you prefer. Sure. So Eli Clare states, gender reaches in to disability. Disability wraps around class. Class strains against abuse. Abuse gnarls into sexuality. Sexuality folds on top of race. 
everything finally piling into a single human body. To write about any aspect of identity, any aspect of the body, means writing about this entire maze. And so I think it also means showing human empathy towards another human body and life. And I hope that you enjoy the weekend and you're doing well. Thank you.